That was the scene from Sam Spiegel's production of Harold Pinter's Betrayal. That was Jeremy Irons and Ben Kingsley. I want you to know what a pleasure it is to be sitting across from you. It's delightful to be here. Thank I you. I just arrived from New York, and it's my first visit to Toronto in 10 years. And I wish I had some time to see what happened to the city as well. Well, you'll be restricted to seeing it from the window of a moving automobile. Good. I was fascinated when someone pointed out, I assume with respect, because Sam Spiegel's name to us means epic. Sometimes small epic, sometimes very big epic. Sometimes but, very small. That's right. Someone suggested that Betrayal was a small movie, comparatively, if one thinks of Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, Nicholas and Alexandra. And you said, is it really? Do you think in a painting about the size of a canvas? That's true. That's not a uh, apocryphal story. That's absolutely a true story. Because I really didn't refer to the picture as a small picture. It is an inexpensive picture, at best in terms of uh, expenditure that you invest in a movie. But the content of a movie is re really not measured in size, but in value. And I thought that the theme and the values that the picture had in itself were just as important and just as grand as the uh, a picture of the size of Lawrence of Arabia or African Queen or, or Bridge on the River Kwai or suddenly last summer definitely had also a small background and a small kind of s s amount of sets and so on. But that's not how we measure movies. That's I thought your answer came on two levels, one of them being that you are the producer who has given us not only the epics we both mentioned, but also a small canvas epic like On the Waterfront. And you can say that in 1954, for $750,000. How do you know the cost of the picture better than I do? You brought the film in for $750,000, and the highest salary at the time was Marlon Brando's $150,000. That's true. And you are the producer at the same time who drawing that comparative study on canvas and painting. I was amused because you're the man who all those years Picasso tried to get back the painting you had he had done as a teenager. Now this is really amazing. You are the first person who, who disclosed to me that he knows little about my paintings as well. I haven't. That is absolutely true. I have amongst my collection of paintings a small Picasso that he painted of a village corrida when he was 18 years old. And he had, at the time, just about three years before he died, he didn't have a single painting left of that period. And, it, and he somehow found out that I had it. I have several of his early paintings, but none as early as this, because he didn't paint that much at the age of 18. And he was willing and offering me to exchange it for a much, much larger painting of a later period. Sam, how did you get the painting? How did I you acquire it, it? I bought it shortly before the World War. And I, at that time, I wasn't able to collect very expensive painting. And at the time, large important Picassos were already above my head. I've had them since, but not then. And that was a beautiful painting. It was just, I was so captivated by it that I knew I must have that painting. I didn't have enough money to pay for it. I don't remember now how much it was, but in today's terms, a very, uh, well, minimal amount of money to pay for a painting. But at the time, it was rather put me into, into debt for a few months or few, maybe even a little longer. And I treasured it for a long time. And now it's surrounded by 
Cezanne's and Bonnard's and Gauguin's and God knows what other paintings. And it's still that small little Picasso that attracts my attention very frequently. And I look at it with a great deal of love and affection. Obviously. When you were in London, and I must point out that your friendship with Harold Pinter is over 20 years, and you are the kind of man to whom Harold Pinter would send his work in manuscript form and wait for your opinion. When you were in London and you saw the original London production of Betrayal, you weren't all that impressed. You didn't feel that it worked particularly well. But when it was staged in New York and it starred Raoul Julia, Blythe Danner, and Roy Scheider, you suddenly found that you had reassessed your opinion. You liked it very much. I was it? I, is that true? Go ahead. Is that true? It's absolutely true, except that I first read the script of it, the play script of it, long before it was produced at the National Theatre in London. Actually, I got the first copy of the play when he finished typing it, and it was still full of corrections and so on, and read it and liked it very much as a play, and, but never thought of it, as I very seldom thought of any other printer place as possible movie material, or at least movie material that would appeal to me at the, at the time. And when the, when the play was produced at the National Theatre, I had a great many qualms about it because of the cast. I thought that this is a play that depends so much on the magnetic, electrifying quality of the cast that, that, that you can't possibly cast it with an adequate cast. You have to have an extra magnetic cast. And they didn't have it at the National Theatre. Consequently, in London, it was kind of a success, a normal success. And two years later, it was done in New York, directed by the very same Peter Hall, but with a much more appealing cast. Of course, the problem in New York with this play was that all the three actors were Americans, and they had to send concentrate so much on being British that occasionally they concentrated on being British more than on being great performers in the play. Still, it worked very well, and, and I never intended to, to make a picture of it at the time either. Tell you what, let us take a commercial break. We'll have a look at another scene, and I'll follow up on how you did come to make a film of it. Please. Be right back with Sam Spiegel. That was another scene from Sam Spiegel's production of Betrayal, and that was Patricia Hodge as the adultering, adulterous wife in Betrayal with Ben Kingsley. And I thought it was extraordinary because when David Jones, your young director, was hired for the film, you already had the commitment from Jeremy Irons. And David Jones recommended Ben Kingsley, but when Ben Kingsley walked in, he had just returned from India, where he had, of course, done Gandhi with Sir Richard Attenborough, and he was bald. And wasn't it you, Sam, who suggested somebody find a hairpiece so you well, could see how he might look? <laughs> absolutely true as well, because it's essential in this story that his age and the age of Jeremy Irons, who plays, well, the, the, the second major part. The best the, the friend. Lover, yes. The lover, the best friend, and both of them graduated at the same period from university and so on, that they should be approximately of the same age. And in Gandhi, he looked, I didn't see Gandhi at the time, of course, and I had no idea how, how successful he will be and the picture will be because he just came from India. But he looked, I did see him on the stage in Faustus, where he plays a 70-year-old man. So it was rather frightening to suspect that he could look the age of, of Jeremy Irons. And they put a kind of a odd piece of hair on his head, and suddenly he came to life, particularly with those piercing magnetic eyes that he has. And in a minute, he reduced his age by 30 years. And 
the rest of it, of course, is, is history now because his, his uh, meteoric success in Gandhi has made him the, the biggest name in the picture. At the time, he was completely unknown. That was the first time that he has, to my knowledge, been in the picture other than Gandhi. And Gandhi could have been, for all one knew, completely unsuccessful picture afterwards. As it happened, it became a, a very famous movie and elevated him to stardom. He's now prob considered that one of the probable winners of the Academy Award this year. And he gave a superb performance in our picture. But I was very pleased and happy and complimented and flattered that some of the reviewers, national reviewers in magazines and in New York, thought that he gave a better performance in Betrayal than he did in Gandhi. Well, audiences in Toronto will have to decide for themselves. I must, I must point out, as you say this and give you credit as a producer, that not for nothing did Billy Wilder once say about Sam Spiegel, Hollywood without Spiegel would be like Tahiti without Gauguin. It's true too. Well, there are so you many myths. Every, and everything's a comparative study based on art or paintings with you, isn't it? Well, yes. Well, <laughs> Bill, Billy Wilder and I both are originally from Vienna, Austria. We have become Americans about the same period, same time. And I've known Billy from the age of when he was 19 or 20, and we are still the closest friends today. So praise from Billy comes as very treasured uh, item in my life. And I'm full of praise for him, even in, in a period in which his pictures are less successful than they used to be some years ago. So I heard this, the story about Tahiti and Gauguin. And uh, of course, I'm much too modest to consider myself on that level. Oh, that's all right. I said it out loud. That's I was true. quoting Mr. Wilder on Mr. Spiegel. On that, we will take another break and come back with more. Be right back with Sam Spiegel. If actors win Academy Awards for scenes, Ben Kingsley just got another nomination for that scene with Jeremy Irons. That is a great scene. Well, he does it really superbly because when you you have seen the picture, but the audience that will see it will ex expect him throughout the scene to explode into rage and the betrayal of his best friend and so on. And there is that suppressed rage that uh, expresses itself through condemnation of modern literature and modern art and modern books and, and kind of diverting the, the rage into outlets that one doesn't expect and never, never centers on the real rage that he's capable of. And that is a superb moment of acting. Analysts in the 80s, Sam, now call it implosion. It is. Implosion. It's I must ask you something because it's su such an extraordinary story. First, we have to find out what's apocryphal. There you are sitting one evening with Lady Antonia Fraser, or Mrs. Harold Pinter, Mike Nichols. You are having a very interesting evening, during which Antonia Fraser says, Sam, why don't you make this into a movie? And Mike Nichols jumps in and says, I'll direct it for you. The next thing you know, you have Meryl Streep, who says, I'll star in it for you, with Mike Nichols directing. Then Meryl Streep comes to you and says, on a personal level, my family life and my marriage depend on my remaining in America. You can only make this film in England. Now, if all of that happened, and if Louis Maul hadn't been romancing Candace Bergen, but had already married her as he did, things would have been very different, wouldn't they? How oh, you know, you must have been disguised as a fly on the wall in my home and, and in my office, because you really know so many uh, concrete and obscure details that I've really never revealed to anyone. And, and I feel like on the couch of a psychoanalyst 
that you really subject me to questions that are true. The that important thing in all of this is that you made betrayal, and of it is course, available to moviegoers. On that, we will take another break and come back with more. Be right back with Sam Spiegel. Do I start? No, I'll, I start. <laughs> Sam Spiegel is with us. I, I wanted to follow up on something because I had said, I was paraphrasing you, and you had said that between 1952 and 62, with five classic hit films, not to mention 35 Oscars, three of them for best film, that you felt you had lost touch with the audience. And the correction was that perhaps the audience had lost touch with the movies. Well, the audience has changed so enormously. The audience that attends movie theaters has been subjected to 10 years of onslaught by violent television. And I don't mean the television center at which I'm sitting now, because I don't see anybody shooting guns and, and falling off bridges and crashing cars and, and, and crashing airplanes and so on. But it, there is no unified test taste today. Each segment of the population has a different, well, I wouldn't say, call it taste, but demand for entertainment. It is entirely unrelated to taste or to judgment. It's just diversion for, a, they want to, to escape the realities of whatever life they they, they, they witness in their daily existence. And, and there is really each segment of the population demands something different. When we were making pictures in the 50s and 60s, we tried to appeal to the highest level of intellectual, moral, artistic, well, academic judgment as well, in addition to every day's requirements of entertainment. That audience disappeared as a totality, as, as a kind of whole public to, that you try to reach. It's strange to say today, but in the 50s and 60s, we used to make pictures that, and so did Hollywood, and so did many other people other than myself, make pictures that were addressed, let's say, to, to, to Boulevardier in Paris or in Ottawa or in Toronto or in New York, and were appreciated and understood by a coolie in, in Singapore, as I usually try to say, because they really had addressed themselves to the best in human intellect. And by addressing themselves to the best, they reached the most. I've said it several times, and I feel like re repeating myself. But the truth is that a picture like Bridge on the River Kwai by some accounts, by some statistics, has reached almost two-thirds of the world's population. Now, it gives you a sense of terrific responsibility. You really, before you make a picture or decide to make a picture, you really spend sleepless nights wrestling with doubts whether you really do the right thing to inflict upon such huge numbers of humanity. And then, when you finally decide you're going to do it, you really try to reach as much perfection as you possibly can. Nowadays, people make pictures for television, which is a monster that consumes 24 hours of, of, of pictures or, or events or images every day on, I don't know how many channels in Toronto, but in New York, it, probably un uncounted channels. And 
once it runs through that cavalcade of channels, it's forgotten and, and some replacement has to be found. Well, nobody, but nobody is genius enough to fathom what really will satisfy the audiences or what really is worthy of as much attention as one gave to a picture when, when we spent two, three years in preparing one picture or four years. Like, I spent four years doing Lawrence of Arabia from the inception till the finished product was four, four years of my life. But you know, when, when you say that, Sam, and I realize what did indeed go into Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, on the waterfront, suddenly last summer, Nicholas and Alexandra, and African I go, queen, African queen. Ages. And I go even further back into your life, and I think of you arriving in Berlin as the man who ran the Universal Headquarters. And the night that All Quiet on the Western, Western Front opened in the theater, and they bombed the theater, they banned the movie. And somewhere, somehow, Sam Spiegel got the ban lifted, and the movie played. Well, the ban was not really lifted. We just, we just found a way around it by showing it to club memberships. And any, anybody who wanted to see the picture signed a little ticket while he purchased his admission ticket, signed a, a little piece of paper joining the club, did the seeing it then. And even that didn't. That was the year in which the National Socialists, which is the Nazis, were fighting for the election in Germany that brought Hitler into power. And there were still forces in Germany that tried to prevent it. And the issue of, of all quiet on the Western Front became a national issue much beyond its value as a picture. It became really the, the apple of contention, or the, well, let's say apple of contention. I was going to use a, a less appetizing fruit that really made the difference between being pro-Nazi and being anti-Nazi. People, the, the membership of the Reichstag, of the German parliament, spent 11 days doing nothing else but discussing the censorship of all quiet on the Western Front. And the government at the time was Catholic and center. And there were two wings, the communists and the Nazis. The communists to the left and the Nazis to the right. And they were parading in uniforms. Well, I was sitting in a box surrounded by by a security man given to me by this centrist government because they were afraid that the Nazis would just take this young man representing Universal movies and, and, and quarter him or, or, or shoot him or whatever it was. Now, the, the final victory of this idea of no censorship for clubs was con conceived as a kind of a metaphor that everybody will accept. And the Nazis vo voted against it. And during that period, I had to show the picture in a private projection room to every Nazi, every member of parliament, but all Nazi parliaments, the parliamentarians came to see it as well. That's how I met Goering and Goebbels and Himmler and all the people who, had I been in Germany a few weeks or a few months later, I, had, I would have been converted into, into a lampshade. Where in all of this did you meet Mussolini? No, Mussolini was not in, in that period. Much was, later? No, no, almost six months later, because the picture was banned, as, as was the book, also in Italy. And again, it was, the apple, the, the bone of contention between the liberal forces in Italy and the fascist government of Italy. 
And people want, didn't want to, there was a large segment of population that wanted to read the book and see the picture. And I've shown the picture to Mussolini in his private projection room at dinner with him and his family. And I wasn't awed by it because I was really so deeply involved in the issue, not of the picture itself, but the, 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 the basic issue of freedom of, of, of communications and of fighting fascism or whatever. I was young and very ambitious to find a place in, on the platform of the world. And Mussolini assured me that night, he spoke, I speak Italian, but he spoke very good English. And he assured me, this picture will pass the censorship. And two days later, I was notified officially that would I please leave the country and take the picture with me. That just goes to show how much honesty existed in, in, in fascist minds. Sam Spiegel is with us. I must, I must ask you for the correct pronunciation. Is it Jaroslaw, Austria? Yes. Which is now Poland. Now it's Poland. But I, I was, as a child, I moved to Vienna. You moved to Vienna. And I, I've always been fascinated when you were at the University of Vienna because you left to be a young pioneer in Palestine. How do you know that? <laughs> Did you? You <laughs> were, Sam, a young pioneer yes, in Palestine. I went for, well, a whole group of students in Vienna, men and women, boys and girls, in their early 20s. We all went to Palestine long before there was an Israel. And our kind of purpose was to drain marshes and to, to stop the spread of malaria. And in the course of it, we intended to stay a year. And after about seven or eight months, I contracted a very bad case of malaria and had to leave the country to cure it. And it took me years to get rid of of, of that basic malaria then. Well, anyway, I've been since to Israel many, many times as a visitor. And the places that we used to, the locations that we used to drain of, of marshes are now wonderfully prosperous cities, colonies, uh, kibbutz, uh, there isn't a trace of malaria anywhere in, in Palestine now. All of it has been eradicated during these years. But Sam, was your first trip to the United States of America as a cotton broker? What was well, a cotton broker in the 20s? Well, I wasn't really a cotton broker. I had to find a means of, of existing. I was w working in some kind of brokerage office for a while that specialized in cotton. I knew nothing about cotton and l much less about brokerage. That's why I went to California and, and went to, to my favorite occupation, which was dramatic literature. Can I assume because you were lecturing in California on European theater and literature that your major at the University of Vienna was? Two dramatic literature and economics. And this is strangely enough, probably the only two subjects that I would have taken today had I known that I will spend 40 years as a motion picture producer. Sam, what happened after he was then a producer at MGM, Paul Byrne, heard one of your lectures and hired you, and you were going to be the specialist who consulted Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer on European properties. But something happened, and six months later, they fired you. Didn't they like your readings or well, recommendations? they liked my readings, except my boss at the time was, well, I really shouldn't name him. The head of the department of the editing department, which is the story department, was a shirt maker, a very well-known shirt maker in New York, who married into one of the 
families, uh, Skank family, or one of the families that owned MGM. And he didn't like the idea that I corresponded directly with publishers of plays in Europe to find out the availability of a play for motion pictures. Don't forget that happened in the first year of pictures being made, talking pictures being made. Till then there was no problem of, of languages because you just changed the subtitles. And, and it was, I was very young and, and the industry was very young and talking pictures were practically non-existent. And everybody thought, everybody in all the companies, including the MGM, thought that the only way to make pictures from then on would have to be bring in a cast of French-speaking actors, German-speaking actors, Italian-speaking actors, Spanish-speaking actors, and so on. And the first picture made at MGM, I saw it uh, at the time, was Loma Anabi, uh, played by Yves Mirand. And it had just a literal translation from the English script into French, German, Italian, Spanish, and so on. And the director would set up a scene and shoot it with English speak, American speaking actors. They would leave their places that were marked in front of the camera after the scene, and a French group would get in and take the same positions and say the same things, but in literal French. And then they would walk away and the Germans would come in and so on. And of course it was disastrous because what sounds good in America and didn't sound really that good in French or German or Italian. And that's when uh, I started thinking of finding some place that could be converted into other languages. And this, I might just well remember now, his name was Harris, the man, the shirt maker, who was head of the story department. He became very jealous of it that he couldn't read in, in other languages. He barely read English. And so I, I was fired. And Paul Byrne, who tried to protect me with all the mighty position that he had and all the influence that he had at the studio, just threw his hands up because there was no way for him to fight a man who was married. That, that was really the age of nepotism in the, in the picture industry in California. It's all right, Sam. 30 years later, almost to the year, they awarded you with the Irving Thalberg Award. That's so true. it's full circle. And on, on that, we have to take a break, but I'll bring that up when we come back. Be right back with Sam Spiegel. Sam Spiegel is with us. I was, I was reminding myself, and we were just talking about the fact that 40 years ago, almost, almost to the date, you were the producer of an all-star drama called Tales of Manhattan. And 40 years later, we have the same distributor, 20th Century Fox, distributing Betrayal. And I've always been curious because even with the all-star cast of Tales of Manhattan, and you had Charles Boyer, Rita Hayworth, Charles Lawton, Elsa Lanchester, on and on. Ginger Rogers. Yes, yes, <laughs> Ethel Waters. Was there a sequence with W.C. Fields that you deleted before you released the film? I haven't deleted. The film was too long, and we saved that to, at the time people were releasing shorts you know, 15 minutes pictures that preceded the main feature of the day. And I left it really cut and completely finished. And when I left 20th Century Fox, years later, while I was already working on, on pictures abroad and, and in Hollywood and away from Hollywood, but away from 20th Century Fox, I one day asked the editing department to find that sequence because by that time, of course, Fields was dead and it was a priceless bit of film with Phil Silvers and discovered to my shock that they have 
shredded it. They were trying to empty this overstocked cutting room or storeroom for film and didn't pay any attention as to what they were shredding. And a real, real pearl of a performance by W.C. Fields disappeared. Sam, let me say something. 40 years later, from Tales of Manhattan to Betrayal, thank you for a lifetime of wonderful motion pictures. And please finish your autobiography so we can meet again and continue this conversation. Thank you very much. You're it will welcome. be a pleasure to continue it, maybe with another picture. All right. Before the autobiography. I'd like that even more. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye.